Hello, good evening everybody, uh, both at the Orange Tribune of the Faculty of Architecture and the Build Environment, as well as at home, watching us via YouTube. Um, I'm very happy today to uh, celebrate and uh, uh, organize the third BK Talks, the third edition of the BK Talks, that has to do with living together in the city that we hope uh, we will be able to build together. Um, I will give the word to Darinska uh, in a minute. Uh, I'm very happy that today we are counting with the presence of politicians and policy makers uh, with whom we need to talk together in order to realize the city, the house and the spaces that we all want. Um, today the moderator Martin van Ham uh, was not feeling well so he finally needed to cancel his participation as moderator. That's why Darinska Shiske, leader of the uh, of the Project Together team will be moderating the, the session. I won't extend myself with any more words. I want to hear actually what policymakers and uh, politicians have to say on how to build the city we dream of. Uh, so Darinka, the floor is yours and uh, let's have a nice session. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Javier, once again. Hello everyone at home, at work or here uh, in the Oranje Sal. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, again, uh, even though it, well, it's to replace our colleague uh, Martin Van Ham, who unfortunately is, is unwell today. Uh, but well, I, we've been working hard with our speakers of today for, for many weeks in preparing for what we hope is going to be a golden uh, closing event of the series of BK Talks about Project Together. And um, well, if we go to the next slide. I can tell you there. I can tell you who are our guests today. Um, Eduard Cabré Romans is joining us from Barcelona. Unfortunately, we had another uh, last minute change of uh, speakers. In this case, the um, councillor for uh, housing for Barcelona, uh, Lucia Martin, had an unexpected um, situation to deal with uh, regarding her, her work, and she cannot be with us this evening. However, luckily, we have uh, one of her advisors, uh, Eduard, with us and he's going to be representing the city of Barcelona and their policies uh, here today. Um, we also have Trevor James, um, the chair of CopeLink in the Netherlands, Bjorn Malans, who comes from Flanders, social housing uh, associations, and also he's part of the board on, of Housing Europe. Uh, Hans Rupp is joining us from Zurich, from the cooperative sector there. Karin Schrederhof, well, you know her, she's our local uh, host, um, councillor for housing at the city of Delft, and a member of the steering board of uh, Project Together. And finally, we have Desiree Outsetter from BPD and Neprom, but uh, she's unfortunately stuck in traffic. So we have to deal with some unexpected uh, absences or delays, but uh, we're gonna get started anyhow. And to do that, I would like to uh, briefly give you a recap. For those of you who haven't been able to watch the first BK Talks uh, related to Project Together, I think it's important to uh, look back at why we're doing these events and um, what is the, um, the sequence between the three BK Talks. So firstly, we wanted to explore why we think that it's important to focus on collaborative housing or collaborative living forms, as we call them. And if you remember, those of you who already watched the previous speaker talks, um, I introduced the series by looking at what we call the housing crisis in post-industrial societies. We see these headlines in the newspapers and also we look at a lot of books that are being written about the so-called housing crisis. So this is something that I've been hearing for many decades already in Europe since, since I started working in the field of social housing at first. And I have come to believe that uh, we're not really in the face of a crisis because a crisis is something short-lived and acute that one can either manage or it somehow turns into a structural condition. So I think that, in fact, what we are looking at is a structural uh, deficiency of our housing systems to uh, give answers to changing needs of the population in terms of adequate and affordable housing. So if we continue, next slide, please. 
uh, we see that th this challenge is, has become very much of a global challenge. There are other societies, not only European and post-industrial, but also uh, countries where which are developing very quickly and are starting to experience this problem. And also we see it very locally. Here in the Netherlands, as you can see in this slide, we have a call from the government, the Dutch government, um, in the past years to build one million homes by the year 2030. And that's really a massive task, uh, which has led many of us, particularly here in the, the university, to uh, adopt a more critical look at, well, is this only about building more, or is it really also about asking ourselves what kind of homes, for whom, and in which circumstances, what, uh, in what locations, for instance, in, in what configurations, what does that mean for our cities, for the way we want to live together? Next one. And we also see some promising uh, developments recently. Um, there have been some thinkers and, and activists who are claiming that we really need to look at wider processes, uh, notably the financialization of housing. Let's stay with that one, please. Um, I already uh, presented about this in the first BK talk. I won't expand myself into this, but I'm sure that the audience is familiar with the work of uh, the UN Rapporteurs for the Right of, to Adequate Housing. First, Raquel Rolnik, she wrote a book about her experience as rapporteur, uh, describing the, this process of financialization and what it does to our cities and to our, our communities. And then uh, Leilani Farah, her successor, also has started a movement um, and, and she collaborated in a, in a movie depicting um, the problem we, we experience with housing. At the same time, here in the Netherlands, we've had two very big protests in the last couple of months about the housing crisis. So even a country which once was held as an example in, in Europe and worldwide as one of the strongest uh, countries when it came to affordable housing is now facing this, this problem. But there's also hope, and uh, we hope that our project together, um, which is actually uh, happening at the same time of another big event, the Biennale of Architecture in Venice uh, this year, is also addressing this topic. Um, and this is a coincidence, but it is not a, coincid a coincidence. I also I wanted to have this um, this poster there, this their logo, because I think that this is telling us something about the uh, spirit of the times. Um, when we talk about housing, we also talk about communities. We talk about how we want to relate to each other uh, in close proximity. We have a lot of challenges of how to live together. It's not all necessarily all rosy and cozy. There are a lot of tensions, and we're going to be exploring that uh, in the coming uh, minutes. And I see we have our, our last guest has arrived, so this has been great timing. Um, if we continue... Well, we are going to talk about what we term collaborative housing. For those of you who are not initiated in this, in this topic, in this concept, basically we're looking at a number of urban collective initiatives or trends where people come together to realize uh, projects such as co-working spaces, uh, local economic uh, uh, initiatives, um, building on peer-to-peer -peer economics, so uh, not the sharing economy where we see um, a commercially oriented exchange between uh, people, but the peer-to-peer the -peer economy in the sense that you exchange and you share resources uh, to benefit each other. Um, urban commons is also something happening like in the shape of uh, gardens and, and other uh, urban resources, but the missing link so far has been understanding the potential of collaborative or commoning in housing um, as, as, a, as a way to look at our housing problems. Next one, please. And this is what Project Together is about. Um, we've had, as I said, the first BK talk focusing on the why question. That means uh, speakers who really reflected on why we feel this is important to discuss. And the second one, only uh, three weeks ago or so, we looked at very concrete methods, tools, um, and, and type of instruments that would help us to realize these projects and what are the challenges. And today we are focusing on the political aspect, that means what policies led by politicians or by policymakers in power um, 
do we need in our cities in order to make this change happen at a larger scale and on a more long-term basis? Um, but what is interesting... Can you go back? I think uh, the, there is a slide where I introduce the speakers, or not yet? <laughs> okay, sorry. I think I introduced the, the speakers well enough, and they can also say something about themselves when they start uh, discussing. So I'm going to tell you um, very briefly how we're going to do this. This is going to be a bit different from the previous PK talks, because we wanted to create a real exchange, a lively exchange between our speakers, and um, we selected a number of uh, statements or quotes which we thought were very interesting from the first two BK talks uh, because they raise dilemmas, tensions, uh, difficult points that uh, political leaders should address if we are to move towards more collaborative living environments. So we're going to show you these excerpts, the videos, to, to look back at the BK talks, and then we're going to put a simplified statement about this, these quotes on the screen. And then I'm going to ask our guests to give us their impressions on the basis of their experience of what they do in their country, in their city. So I will take a seat now and we're going to start. <laughs> if you will, let's look at the but first. But what is interesting statement. about the housing sector is that it's actually moving from one side of the screen the right-hand side screen, whereby people were setting up housing like this because of an opportunity they had. They thought, you know, we, all the reasons that were mentioned, like community building, and we see the advantages of it in many different ways. It's now actually moving to the left-hand side, whereby people are setting up co-housing and collaborative housing in general, because they have no other choice, because there is not enough space, or their budget is not available, etc. So, that you, in some sectors, really, that nothing much changes. But I think in co-housing and collaborative housing, you see things moving from the left, from the right to the, the left, from an opportunity to out of need. We really believe that uh, this model has a lot uh, to offer, uh, combining this uh, uh, collective approach. Um, this community -led, uh, the community-led approach and also the, the sustainable and long-term vision. Uh, I think that this model uh, can really uh, be part of the answer to the uh, housing crisis in the European cities and also provide uh, well, uh, uh, an answer to the, to the uh, different crises that are uh, in ahead of us. Thank you. So um, these were two of our previous speakers. The first one was Tina de Moore, professor of social uh, enterprise and collective action at Erasmus University. Um, and then we had Herr de Pau, who is the coordinator of the Community Land Trust Brussels in Belgium, and also uh, a leader of one of, of the largest uh, European projects to uh, get more CLTs, more community land trusts off the ground in northwestern Europe. And, well, we thought it was interesting uh, from Tine's uh, uh, reflection that um, what she sees in her research is that housing cooperatives and community-led housing are moving from, in the past, being organized for more idealistic uh, motives to today being organized because of need. And this, is, we feel, is very interesting to understand, uh, to connect to the housing crisis, really. Because it appears that while before there were value-driven um, initiatives, now more and more they are uh, alternatives to uh, sectors that are not providing. They're not, uh, uh, either the market or the public sector, or even the, the housing associations are not fulfilling the role that they used to. Um, and then, well, there's this example from community land trust can be one of the models, community-led models, that can be part of the solution. Uh, and I thought it was interesting in Hirt's formulation that he said also not only for the housing crisis, but he mentioned one of the many crises ahead of us. And by that, I think he refers to environmental crisis, energy crisis, uh, health crisis. So I would like to start maybe by asking uh, Björn. <laughs> okay. You're the lucky one, because Bjorn is, is going to wear two hats today, right? 
One is in your capacity as, um, the, from Flemish social housing sector and, uh, and also Housing Europe, which brings together a lot of housing providers um, yeah, across uh, Europe. So, well, choose your hat or maybe combine them. No, I, I, I'll <laughs> combine it. And I think in, in uh, explaining the combination uh, that I will, will already stress some of the aspects that are quite important in a way that uh, I'm the director of the Flemish Association of Social Housing Companies. Uh, we are, if you compare it in, in, in Northwestern Europe, uh, rather small as a social housing sector. We have about 6% of the housing stock, uh, if you compare it with, with the Netherlands, for instance, but also with France, with, with the UK, it, 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 it's a small sector. Uh, and it's a sector that, in a way, looks at social housing as uh, a solution for a problem. So we believe, or used to believe in Flanders very much, uh, in house ownership and in individual solutions for housing. So everybody should be able to buy their own house. That was the main political idea of housing in Flanders. And well, if people couldn't do that, we provided social housing on a very small scale, 6%, not much, but we saw it as a kind of last resort solution. At the same moment, Housing Europe as, as the umbrella organization of all social collective and public housing associations in, in Europe, uh, has very different approaches throughout Europe. We see, for instance, in Sweden that we have a very, very uh, evolved and a very developed uh, cooperative housing sector, which is as big as the public housing sector, and if you combine both of them, we have one third of the housing stock in, in Sweden. Uh, if you look at the Netherlands with 30% social housing, uh, very rigid in a way, very top-down control, but very big. And I think what we see now at European level is that we start to look, and that's what Geert, I know Geert very well, of course, he's from Brussels, uh, so we meet a lot. And what he was, was, was trying to explain, in my view, is that we have to look at all these models not as a solution for a problem that we see as policymakers top down, but we have to start from the initiative that people take themselves and see how we can use it and how we can add all these different solutions to make uh, a very good and a very future-proofed uh, housing model. Uh, and not only in ways of affordability, but also, as you said, in ways of, of, of the climate change, why, where I think we can also make a very, very important uh, difference uh, from, from the public, cooperative and, and social housing uh, field. Uh, but also, for instance, in ways of, of spatial planning. Uh, so that's, that's something that we see also in Flanders, is that uh, we never, well, if you, if you travel through Flanders, you see that the spatial planning is not really our cup of tea, <laughs> to, to, to say it in a very friendly way. Uh, now, of course, we see that we have a, have a lot of problems with, with, with uh, flooding and, and other problems in ways of spatial planning, so we have, we have to think about that. And we see there that this um, top-down approach and only trying to solve really... Uh, difficult problems and all these trying to, to provide solutions for, for real problems, that, that's not the way that policy has to work. Policy has to work uh, bottom-up and has to take all these different initiatives that are available, all these uh, engagements from people who try to build something, and pun intended with, with the building team of course, but try to build something uh, in ways of uh, providing housing solutions. Uh, and I think the last thing I want to say in, 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 in that aspect is that uh, it's in English now and, and housing uh, is, is in a way a, a term that I think we have a very, very beautiful uh, term in Dutch and that's, that's wonen. And wonen is it's about not only the house, it's also about the home. And I think that should be the individual that lives and makes the home out of the house. That should be the policy approach that we try to develop in the future. Indeed, thank you. And um, 
Uh, what is the role that you see here for uh, groups of, of people who want to do things together um, in the Wohnen, as you say, living, uh, kind of a rough translation, right? There is a combination of housing and living. Huh? Because, yeah, that has a lot to do with conviviality, with the collaboration. Uh, how do you see that playing out in the wider systems of provision? Well, I, I think w what's important is that um, policy, politics, uh, but also the, the more organized, broader uh, housing organization, housing associations, or how it's called uh, throughout Europe, uh, has to, to take into account that they can provide the space, uh, the, 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 the space to actually develop this kind of initiatives. Um, not from the idea that everything will go perfect, especially not, or not, not from the start, but also not from, from the perspective that we will provide everything for you and you just have to move in, put in your furniture and we have a solution. No, uh, work with these people who have these engagements to actually try to, to build these kind of projects uh, from, from the bottom up and, for instance, provide uh, the location provide the knowledge we have. Um, and, and one of the first things, I used to be uh, the vice chairman of, of a housing association in Flanders way back. And one of the first things, more than 20 years ago, was what I said to my, to my uh, management was, well, we're going to, to renovate a very big neighborhood. Let's ask the people who live there how we should do that. And they looked at me, they ask the tenants how to renovate the neighborhoods. Oh, okay, that might be an interesting idea. And I think we should develop these kind of sometimes very simple steps, but just to take people along with you uh, to, to look at housing and, and also social housing, not as a solution for a problem, but as a solution anyway, as a way to build your own home, uh, home your own house, uh, and, and to... to translate that engagement in, in, in a very concrete way. Thank you. So I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts about this. Uh, Hans, yes? Uh, thank you very much. It's a very, very interesting introduction. I'd like to add one aspect. It's uh, not just about houses. It's not just about wohnen. It's also about communities, building communities. And that's a, a very strong incentive uh, uh, to enable uh, these, these initiatives. Uh, uh, it's very interesting, the, the first phrase, uh, because I'm coming from Switzerland, from Zurich. We have a very strong movement. It's uh, about 25% market share in Zurich alone. It's not so in Switzerland. Switzerland is 3%. But the movement in Switzerland started over 100 years ago. And it didn't start as a lifestyle initiative, as it's seen today, but it started as a real deep housing and health crisis. And uh, what, what was interesting uh, was that um, no one could solve it alone. So the town of Zurich, which was poor, but had a lot of land outside uh, of, the, of the city walls, uh, teamed together with the, the people that formed housing cooperatives. And they formed, they, they, they gave the initiative, they, get, uh, they even financed uh, a, a lot of things. And by, by teaming up and giving in the strength each, uh, from each other, uh, a very strong and lively and long lasting movement was born. And um, we probably come later to, to it. Uh, uh, there are some success factors. Building communities is one. Um, you also mentioned the, the ownership thing. Uh, uh, I'm also, uh, I have also different hats. Uh, I'm also uh, board of director of Cooperative Housing International. Uh, what we see on the international level is the failing, as I might strongly say it, of the ownership model. And we see a prevalence of the rental model, especially in Sweden. And we see that, that uh, when the markets uh, uh, dump, uh, go down, and we ha when we have a lot of migration. When people uh, uh, are in need to access the market that do not have the capital. So the, the, this non-speculative aspect is very important. I also would like to say that uh, this collective ownership, not the individual ownership, is a very interesting key point that we're probably going to discuss today. 
Thank you. Anybody else? Karim, maybe? What, what are your thoughts in the Dutch context? Yeah, the Dutch context, we, we have a big social housing sector and the rest is uh, your own house. Uh, and the uh, uh, social housing sector isn't involved in collaborative housing or more collective housing. They are more for the affordable housing. So I think uh, within for a year or five before, uh, collective housing or collaborative housing was more uh, a way of life than uh, it was a necessity in, uh, in uh, Holland. At this moment, you see something else because the people who are not uh, getting uh, a dwelling or a house in the social housing sector uh, are searching for rental houses and we don't have them enough. And in that uh, sector, you see that uh, the dwellings are more little and that pushes us to do something more collective. So the collective is your washing machine or the place to uh, work. Uh, uh, uh. So. I think it's coming in Holland, but I think the social housing sector made it not so uh, not so big. That's that's a very interesting point, and it leads me to ask uh, maybe Trevor, yeah. as a chairman of uh, Coplink, representing a housing cooperative. So, what is the role for the new housing cooperatives? Because uh, just a little bit of context uh, for the audience, uh, housing cooperatives are not. Uh, a very, very common feature, or not at all, for the last century in the Dutch uh, housing landscape, right? Uh, that's partly true, but we have what uh, you would probably call a management cooperative, uh, quite a lot of them in ownership of social housing. Um, so, but what we're seeing now is, is a new wave of new initiatives. Uh, Coop Link's got uh, 120 affiliated, affiliated uh, uh, initiatives, and um, although maybe need is one of the, the drivers, um, it's not the only driver. What we see is uh, a very strong commitment to community, a very strong commitment to the climate. The most innovative project in the Netherlands in building in terms of climate change is Ecodor Buchel has, has won loads of prizes, and it's 36 houses which have been uh, in the form of a housing cooperative. And not only is it a housing cooperative, it's also a member of Freiko, which is an idea that once they've paid off their loans, they will be able to subsidize new uh, housing cooperatives in, uh, in that way. So um, I think we have a, a tradition, it's not a great one. Co-op Link is at this moment um, doing some research as to how many collective or collab collaborative uh, housing schemes there are in ownership of, hou of uh, housing associations. Um, and we're seeing in a new, uh, new wave that there's a lot of new initiatives which a community uh, is uh, the, one of the major drivers and climate is the other. That's very, very interesting. And maybe I would like to move on to the next statement. Um, Every, everyone will have the opportunity to talk, for sure. I will not uh, let any of you go without uh, having your say. But um, because we are touching on the issue, again, on, on need and affordability, uh, let's listen to what Michael Lafont from uh, Co-Housing Berlin uh, told us when he, he came to, to talk to us. The Springfield Berlin, this brings us up to the last 10 years, I've been living here and working here for the last seven or eight years, involved in the development for three years before that, so it's turning into a life project for myself. Um, special place, but I have to say, it's one of the last projects out of this phase in Berlin where we could organize self-organized, cooperative, relatively affordable community housing. It's not possible anymore. It's something of a tragedy. Berlin has been gentrified. It's a great example. I'm happy to live there and work there. People come and visit and, and want to know how to do it. I say, I'm sorry, it can't be done again, at least not in the downtown of Berlin. So it's something of a tragedy. Berlin has been gentrified. Sorry, can't be done anymore, at least not in downtown Berlin. We, we were almost in tears when we heard Michael saying this, because for those of us who have visited Spreefeld, it's a fantastic project. Uh, it's, I mean, architecturally, 
its location, central location, really the standards and the community feel. So for anyone who likes this type of, of housing, it's, it's kind of one of the places to visit. But things have changed so rapidly. So we have the issue of gentrification. There's, it's really very difficult to access land and uh, opportunities to realize this project. So, um, Maybe I look here at Desiree, she's uh, from the developer's world, and uh, I would like to, to hear your views. Uh, how can we deal with this gentrification trend and get affordable, cooperative, collaborative housing as part of the mix? Yeah, well, it's actually quite simple, I would say, because this uh, pressure on the housing market is very big in the Netherlands. Also the pressure on the city, so land prices go up. So as a local authority, we are used to getting tenders where we have to do this kind of housing. So we are a project or an area developer in the Netherlands, one of the biggest. And I have another head, like the chair of the Dutch development, uh, develop, project developers. And we see that uh, more and more local authority, they ask this of us. If we want to, yeah, to, to win a tender, or to, to make a plan for a piece of the city, we have to do a part of collaborative housing. And we see that actually our main business is uh, project development, so uh, houses, we, we design uh, the area, we uh, have the houses built, we find the buyers. But since like 10 years, since the last crisis, we see that we involve new buyers or renters of houses much earlier in the process. Yeah, we had the financial crisis in the Netherlands, which struck very hard on the housing markets. At that time, before that time, we had like 10 buyers for one house. And during the crisis, we had like 10 houses for one family. So we had to change our business model. So we started to really do demand-driven development. So we listen much better to what the local needs are, how communities are formed, and we have involved this in the way we do the business nowadays. And we have some nice examples in the Netherlands where we, uh, we actually work together with the neighborhood. Also in a neighborhood which is mainly social housing, where we have uh, social economic problems as well as the houses are in a certain state, they have to be uh, re redone. Uh, where we work together intensively, local authority, project developer, building company, but especially the people living in the neighborhood. They are actually the, yeah, our, how do we say it in English, our opdrachtgevers. They your, are, we your commissioner, your they are our commissioners yeah. in, in a way. So we don't decide for ourselves with the local authority what we build, but the people living there, they tell us how the neighborhood can be improved in a better way. And that is on a large scale, like a neighborhood of uh, 25,000 people living there and like 5,000 new houses need to be done there. So it's a long-term commitment that we do. And it's not like individual small scale projects in collaborative ways, but much bigger scale um, of development. And I see that there are yeah, actually we have a new planning law next year being yeah, implemented in the Netherlands, which asks of us to do participation, it's called. But you can look at participation in different ways. Is it like informing the local community? Is it asking advice of them? Is it, or is it really to co-produce together? And we would say we have to yeah, develop more uh, means, but I, I see positive signs in the Netherlands for that. Well, that all sounds very positive, but well, I'm here also to steer a little bit of uh, oh. debate and controversy. So I would yeah, like but to. I understand your problem yeah. because the housing market is not very healthy in the Netherlands. Uh -huh. So we have an enormous demand and too little supply. So we have the pressure on the prices, on the land, on everything. So it is a problem to do this right and to do this in every city on the right mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. But I see small. <laughs> yeah. Diamonds growing. Yeah, yeah I believe but so. But I, I, my follow-up question was, doesn't it depend a lot on municipality, by municipality? Because what I know yeah. is that certain municipalities are certainly more, uh, more forward-looking uh, in this sense, more pioneering. They want to work with groups of citizens and they give them even uh, land, yeah. you know, like Amsterdam. Yeah. But there are other municipalities where we see that it, it is the opposite, actually. Yeah. So as a developer, how, how do you... Uh, address that? I mean, 
can you do something to, yeah. to push yeah. for, for it? If yeah, you we really see believe that when the local authority asks for it, it's, it's the best way to start it. Yeah. Yeah? And sometimes we start it, we see that uh, people uh, searching for houses, they come to us to develop a plan together. That's also a possibility, but mainly it's the local authority that demands it from the developer, then it starts growing. And I hear from my colleagues that it's much more fun to do projects together with the future inhabitants of your houses than to just uh, to keep them on a the distance. To co-produce is also much more fun. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds very promising indeed. Uh, Trevor, what do you think from your experience talking with groups? Uh, do they also experience it like that or they have uh, some um, the difficult mo most experiences? Don't. And, uh, I think most are looking for affordability in perpetuity. They're looking for not only that it's affordable for the first person who lives there, but for, their, their fo for the people who follow them. Um, and that is a model which I don't think gets realized when we develop it in the way that's just been described. I think it's very good if a developer is willing to listen to uh, uh, people who are the future te uh, residents. Um, but I think it's very important that at least the future residents are involved in the commissioning and also in uh, that we look at a wider range of aspects of community uh, and not, not just the dwellings themselves. Um, and uh, I, had, I was involved in a discussion, um, virtual discussion, with people in Wales last week. They, they were looking to, uh, to, to develop affordable housing in perpetuity for, uh, with co uh, collaborative housing. And um, I told them about the Knarerhof here in, in the Netherlands, which is a, a, a beneficial uh, developer who doesn't take a, a, a significant profit, sells houses below market va value if he has to within the scheme, but basically produces affordable houses for seniors living in collaborative housing. Um, the reaction was, we've never met a developer who does that. <laughs> uh, so, um, I'm, I, to be honest, I'm skeptical. Do you want to respond to that, Desiree? Yeah, well, uh, of course you can be skeptical, but I, uh, what I see is when the pressure on the market is this big, yeah, that is also a discussion between developers for what is a real market price, what is below market price, what is the presence you give to the buyers of the house, and um, is there a way to keep the affordable housing in the affordable segments? That is what we are talking about with the Dutch uh, government now at this moment. How can we keep the affordable housing affordable? Because when the market situation is so unhealthy, like enormous demand, a very hardly any new built houses being done in the Netherlands, then the prices, they rise, they go up. And how can you keep the prices uh, affordable? So we are talking about maybe on the national scale developing a Cope Start fund, it's called. So how can we... Maybe it's more the, the, the former uh, statement about uh, the land trust. How can you keep maybe the, the value of the house in the land in public hands and make sure that the next buyer eh, doesn't pay the, the, the real market price and then the first owner, they say, thank you, developer. You gave me a perfect uh, amount of money to, to go further on. So... So that's a thing we need to tackle in the Netherlands. Yes, but that, it, that's in ter terms of, of land politics. And if we look at, for example, what the, uh, the local authority in Amsterdam is doing to promote uh, uh, housing cooperatives, they are uh, giving land in leasehold, which has got a lot of restrictions on the use of that land. Um, unfortunately, a lot of local authorities don't have a leasehold, but we could look at uh, uh, community land trusts as a way of getting around that and administering that. But it is a very important uh, aspect of the whole housing market within the Netherlands is the fact that people think they can earn a lot of money by buying and selling houses. And we, if we're looking at affordability in perpetuity, then we're going to have to look at a, another system which um, guarantees that. And now that you touch on the issue of land, I would like to move on to the next statement. I know that, uh, Edward, you wanted to say something? I have many thoughts. Okay, uh, in my hold, head, hold on to that, uh, those thoughts because we will come back to this issue. Let's look at what uh, some of our speakers said about land. 
one potential solution to that challenge is much more a much more sort of proactive and aggressive role by local and national governments in freeing up land um, for communities to to access it and purchase it. Um, so whether that's um, you know changes to, to legal uh, to the law that enable uh, that, that give a sort of community right to buy land or community access to lands um, more favourable rights than individuals or, or companies etc. We've seen some of this develop in Scotland. Some 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 rules favouring um, communities to, to to buy up land um, uh, or compulsory purchase powers by municipalities to buy land at its present use value if it's undeveloped, for example, rather than at its future potential sort of hope value. Yeah, if I you may uh, add one last thing. I, I think also we have to dare think about uh, even more radical uh, solutions like, uh, well, land policy reforms, for instance, uh, not seeing land as, uh, as as something that is that can be used for speculation and and m uh, making it the rule that it should be uh, used as a common good these are long-term objectives but i think we we have to dare uh, express these uh, uh, these goals also and then then you go far beyond uh, the projects uh, who are very important too but uh, I think we have to uh, use what we what we learn uh, to see what could be uh, a possible future uh, with a very different system. So those were first Josh Ryan Collins, an ec economist from uh, London, and then uh, here the Paul from Brussels, and they, from very different perspectives and, and, and angles, they they uh, propose the same basically: become more radical. Land policy reform. Some people get the jitters at uh, hearing this. So here maybe Karin wants to say something. Yeah, because that's also a risk. I know uh, two examples in Delft. The, the example at this moment, we are not the owner of the ground in Delft and we don't have an active policy of buying ground. Uh, but we've been owner of the ground when we built the Harness Polder. That's uh, a part of the city uh, at, at, uh, the, at the what would you, corner of the, of the city. There the ground was in, in the hands of uh, private uh, parties and we bought it back and uh, took the uh, uh, um, entwickling? Development. development of the location in our hands and it cost us a lot of money because it was crisis. So it's really difficult for, uh, for a local government to uh, have the ground in their own hands. So what would be your ideal situation? Because on the one hand, it is handy to, to have access to land as a public authority. Yeah, I think sometimes then we have to have the active policy of buying a small part so, so that, that we have a role in uh, the policy of the land. But buying uh, great big spaces in the inner city, we build in the inner city and all the land is uh, in the hands of private uh, parties, I think we have it. Uh, we have to do it, but in in little spaces. I'm curious about how it works in Zurich because you you own a lot of well properties. And what about the land? Well, uh, the, the land is mostly owned by the cooperatives. Um, some is with, with, uh, with land lease from from the town, and uh, we see ourselves as uh, private investors as well, like like you do. But uh, we renounce from speculation and uh, that's something that I really like to touch it, it's it's about the market situation uh, with land you, you explained as well and um, it's not a working market the housing market is not a working market it's not like uh, I, I can go to a different supermarket and buy an, another yogurt it's it's not and I mean that's something you learn at business school in first semester when a market has um, information uh, uh, informally, when, when you have a lock-in situation or where limited or res uh, restri uh, resources are limited, then market fails. So we have to look at it from, from that kind of perspective, not as a working market that we have to heal, some, from something different that we have to approach from, with different politics. And that, I mean, uh, gives the, the, the cities, the towns, the politics 
the, the reason to act strong as it is demanded here in, in this statement. And um, in, in Switzerland, we have the, the uh, opportunity to, to do direct votes. The, the, the people can vote on issues. And we had a vote in, in Zurich that we want to have a 33% market share for cooperative housing for affordable housing in Zurich. So this is, gives the, the town of Zurich the legitimation to introduce planning restrictions, uh, uh, all different kind of instruments to support this goal. So uh, my, uh, my appeal would be towards the, to the governments, to the, to the cities, to act strong on, on the land issue and on the speculation issue because it's not a working market. Thank you, also strong statement. And now I would like to hear uh, from Barcelona. How do you guys deal with this issue? I have so many ideas that I don't know that I will be able to build the sentences. But maybe going back to a word that stuck with me from the previous um, slide, which was tragedy, because this is really what we are dealing with uh, in Barcelona. It's not an unhealthy market. It's really a tragedy that we're living ever since the financial crisis, first with uh, foreclosures related to home ownership, and lately foreclosures in the rental sector because the rents are just skyrocketing. So th when the city is considering what to do with, uh, with all of this, uh, we are really um, focused on affordability, of course, but also in doing things differently. We don't wanna just give out rent subsidies um, so that rents um, keep on growing. We wanna do things in a way that we are building up a new stock of affordable social housing that will be permanently affordable and so on. And in this context, the city is doing many different things, of course. And one of them is supporting the emergence of collaborative housing and cooperatives specifically. And the main way in which we're doing it is by providing public land in long-term leasehold. So this is you know, the topic we're now focusing on is land. The city hands uh, on land um, through uh, long-term leaseholds. We've done it different ways. We first did it through two pilots uh, in which we directly selected the two only cooperative groups that were in a position to do a project and we were piloting it. Then we went through procurement processes in which we uh, made them compete among themselves and uh, uh, in order to allocate the land. But it's been so successful because th this really has proven a, a very good strategy, not only to do collaborative housing, but to do affordable housing, which is what the city at the end of the day wanted to see being done was affordable housing. They're doing affordable housing and they're doing it so good and so quick and so efficiently that the city has now reached an agreement with the cooperatives and the social housing providers in the city to build 1,000 units in the next 10 years. So this has really scaled up really quickly. We started doing this in 2014, is the first land lease that was signed. And uh, in 2021, we're signing this agreement uh, with the sector. Uh, we're very hopeful that they will continue to grow. There are many, obviously, many difficulties, many challenges. The city is also providing uh, returnable loans to the cooperatives so that they can obviously finance and, and fund themselves and, and continue to grow. But the idea is that we want these resources that we're putting into the cooperatives to be available for newer cooperatives uh, along the way. So that we're really building up the sector. We want them to be in a position as a sector to continue to grow because they are a partner for the city in the provision of social housing. Well, I'm always very impressed by what you have been doing basically from scratch in a few years because in, in Barcelona, yeah, you were like most of Spain, a city of uh, homeowners. 2% of um, social housing. I, I remember my first visits to Barcelona many years ago, I mean professional visits, and, and they, were, they were asking me, so how do the Dutch do it? They have so much social rental housing, we want to do the same. And now it seems to be, a tr you know, the opposite trends. It's, it's really fascinating to hear. Um, I have another statement that actually it starts going into what you, you, you started to mention, how to embed the, um, the, the provision of this type of affordable cooperative collaborative uh, housing forms as part of the planning uh, development project. So let's look at the, um, the next slide, please. 
Uh, well, the twenty percent is, is a number to make it clear we should we should change the system from the top down to the bottom up, and that is not talking yet about the, the affordability. Obviously, that is our mission. But we uh, what we try to do, for instance, with larger developers that that create uh, that do area developments with like four to five hundred homes, and we ask them, please give twenty percent to us, and then we give it to the, the people so they can build their own houses, and that will be housing cooperatives that will be different affordable uh, types of, of homes so the, the larger developers can do the 80 percent in the way they always <laughs> they always do yeah. but so it is it's just a, a number to to make it clear that uh, you know it's just 20 percent let's do it so this was Thierry Haku, uh, CEO of um, uh, Space and Matter, one uh, Amsterdam-based uh, architect and urban developer uh, uh, firm. They're doing very, very interesting and innovative uh, stuff, not only in terms of housing, but also area development. Um, they're involved with the, the first uh, CLT in, in, in the Netherlands. And he, he had also quite a radical proposal in a way. He said, okay, why don't developers as a rule give 20% of the new homes to, to the people, well, groups, organized groups to, to develop themselves. So I'm looking at Desiree again. What do you make of that, Desiree? Well, this could be an idea, but I don't think it's the only solution. So I think it's per, per place where you are developing, uh, you have a different demand on housing. So you have to look at it very uh, specifically. So mainstream, like 20% to uh, local groups, I don't think that's the solution. But I think we should, well, talk with the local authorities in how many percent on, in which uh, place is uh, fits there. Uh, would you agree that giving um, a number of sites or, or you know, possibilities for these groups to uh, earmark some land or sites for yeah. them to develop housing would be a nice way to yeah. to go about and mainstream a little bit more this, this initiative. Yeah, but I, I, I sort of resist the mainstream because it's never mainstream. So Maybe not so in the same is, proportion. Uh, but what, uh, in what specific part of the area development can you uh, integrate this kind of groups? That's a thing to, to think about, sure. Yeah. And Bjorn wants to say something. Yeah, of course, because it, it's something that we <coughs> are been addressing and, and it's in combination, of course, with land, eh? because um, the resources from government are scarce in any way. Uh, it's scarce in money, it's scarce in land, which means that uh, <coughs> at a certain moment uh, when you invest to fill the gap between what people can pay and what the house costs, you have to be very careful how you spend it anyway. And so you have to be very careful that you don't, uh, for instance, just give rental subsidies that increase the rent. Capitalization, the ways of mortgage deduction and things like that. You have to be very scared, very careful with that. At the same moment, as a government, as a policymaker, you also have to be very careful with the land, and especially at this moment in, in, in terms of climate change, uh, and uh, with, with a still increasing population in, in Europe, um, well, there is not so much land left. And then I think that you have to be clear that from a policy government perspective, you have the key there. You have the key there uh, also towards uh, private developers. Yeah, so you can... You can eh? Because I, you say there's not much land left. In the Netherlands, we are... A build, the built area is only 12 or 13 percent of the country. The rest, two thirds, is yep. agricultural land. So much more. But, 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 but still, it's it's the government that decides where you can build and where you can't build. Yeah. yeah? So it's also the government that can ask that a percentage of what you build, as a private developer or from any other perspective, can be used for not-for-profit aims. And in my perspective, if that's cooperative or public or social housing, it doesn't really matter in a way, as long as it fits the purpose that you provide affordable housing for people who cannot do that on their own. Because in the end, that's what we're trying to do. We have people in our society that can't provide for themselves from an affordability perspective for housing. They just can't do that. And this is one, in my 
perspective, this is one of the, the aspects that's very important. So if you say to a private developer, okay, maybe you can even increase the amount of stock that you can develop here, but make sure that 20% is used for a social perspective. Is that a cooperative? Is that, that a public? Is that a social? I mean, that, that, that's in ways of, of that's, that's a semantic discussion in a way. But in the end, it's also important, and that's also what, what, what Geert always says uh, in ways of community land trust, is that you don't provide the solution once. And I think that's very important if you look at, at land and if you look at development. Uh, it's not that you provide a solution now. You have to take more or less some kind of control also in the long term. We have a small percentage of social housing in Flanders, 6%. That's not much but it's ours. And we are now redeveloping, we are increasing the density with 20, 30, 40, 50%. So at the same amount of land, we can do a lot more. So that's very interesting that it's still public owned and that we don't have given subsidies in the past and now have to rebuy it. At the same moment, as last thing I want to say, Ghent uh, is very often mentioned as one of, of the, the good examples in Flanders of, of housing policy from some perspective. I mean, you can always discuss about it, of course, but what we see now is that the Belgian railway company is selling a very big amount of land positions in Ghent and they're just offering it to the highest bidder. And then I have something like, it's also, in a way, uh, a task of, of the government as a whole to see what resources are available and not just try to, to outbid each other. And the toughest negotiations we have as social housing providers in Flanders are with local communities because they want every penny they can scratch <laughs> uh, to, to, of course, spend to other very important things they're working on but there should be some kind of global view on that and how indeed you use the land, you use the resources and work together, of course, with the private developers because there, there's one strange thing that, that sometimes people think that, that social housing providers build the houses themselves. Of course, that's not true. I mean, we have no people who are actually building those houses. What it, do it's you still do then? <laughs> <laughs> well, what we do, we, do, we give tenders to contractors <laughs> and developers and they build the houses for us. So it, I think it's important that you look from a global view and combine all these different aspects. But a percentage that is still in public hands is, from my view, very important, also in the long term. Well, there are many things you said that I think others want to react on. Yeah, we first. don't have the ground in, uh, in Delft, but we have a, a housing vision and a housing agenda. So if Desiree comes to... Uh, um, develop. Uh, develop in uh, in Delft, then she knows exactly what we ask for from her. 15% social housing, 15% for uh, student housing, 20% uh, for housing in the uh, rental uh, middle uh, segment. So you know exactly what you are, what you have to do, and the prices of the ground under the social housing are lower than for the the, the expensive houses to uh, uh, who are to buy. So I think we have arranged that very good, uh -huh. but I think that um, the the ground also has a price. So it's a discussion if altogether we can afford that kind of programs, mm -hmm. and it's a political statement. I think there are uh, local governments who want something else mm -hmm. uh, also mm -hmm. in, in this part uh, uh, of, uh, of the Netherlands. So, but ultimately, at least in the Dutch context, we do work with these uh, proportions or percentages that vary uh, locally, right? Uh, but what we're trying to get at here is how to include the co-ops or the, the, co the groups who want to self-build together. And I think that's the missing uh, piece. In yes, the and I think if we think that's important, we have to uh, take it with us in our housing agenda. So it starts with us and it, le it, it and then we will at the end. It. And then yeah. you will follow. Yeah. 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 That's political but leadership. But it's also interesting to hear about, uh, well, well, you stated it right, Karin, about the, the percentages. Some cities, they have like 40% social housing, 
40% mid-rent and 20% free of markets. And then the business case for a developer becomes very difficult, especially because in the Netherlands we want to build as much houses in the current cities as possible. So we have a sort of scarcity which Belgium doesn't know. So in Belgium you can build anywhere. I've been told by the Rijksbouwmeester of Belgium a few uh, months ago. But in the Netherlands we are very limited in where we can build and that drives up the prices as well. Project developers are in the business to develop a project, not to speculate on land prices. They want to do uh, an, good projects that can stay uh, and, and, and create healthy communities for, for a, a decade. So, so we're not in it for speculation. We don't want to drive up the prices, but we do want to make good projects for the coming century. Thank you. So, Edward yeah. is dying to say yeah. something here. I, I just want to share one um, interesting policy that is now in place in Barcelona. We introduced uh, what in the United States called uh, mandatory inclusionary zoning. So, we did have some reserves in terms of land that was created through urban planning processes that had to be set aside for affordable housing that existed for green fields and, and brown fields when an industrial area was converted into residential. But we didn't have that for the, the existing city, which is essentially what we work with because our city is completely uh, built up. And so we introduced 30% uh, of uh, affordable units in any new building or a major renovation that happens in the existing housing stock without increasing um, zone, uh, the, the, the development uh, potential. And the way we worked around that is that we, we realized that speculation is about land, just like you, you said before. And so we, we, we looked at land prices in the city and we said, okay, if we introduce 30% of affordable housing in a new development, how much does that lower the price of that development? And where does that put us in terms of land pricing? And, and so we saw that 30% of affordable housing represented going back three years in terms of land prices. So that, that's how fast it was increasing. And so we said, okay, so then those that um, have bought the land between now and three years from now don't need to comply. But all those who bought before three years it's still going to make it, it's still going to be profitable for them so they should be applying this beginning today and you know we're going to scale up this policy and 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 it's it should work financially developers became very angry of course and hold up onto new projects for a few months but eventually they started asking for licenses again and and they are delivering those units that's a very interesting story <laughs> Netherlands, we have a situation on the actually on the mid rental uh, segment eh, where investors are asked to keep the rent until a certain level of euros per month for the next 20 years, 25 years. But they are all financed by pension funds, so they have to go back to the pension uh, holders or the people in the country. They depend on the pensions. We can pay you as much this. Well, it's not going that far, but the financial system behind the housing situation is very crucial. You have to consider it when you are developing policies. Uh, Private pension funds are also not a very good idea. I, I, I would be much more in favor of public pension funds, but yeah, that's another discussion. That's another we discussion. Have very big uh, pension funds, and if you go in discussion with them, they can show you what a I have for uh, a percentage re uh, uh, rendement. Uh, what's rendement in, in English? Yeah, ah, if you don't know. <laughs> Return of investments. They have to have 4%, 4%, I think. And then it is a spreadsheet. Just fill it in. So I think you can make appointments with with our pension funds, but they are very big and, in uh, To be in very Netflix. honest, in, in ways of, of investors, uh, pension funds or whatever, I don't think that the main problem is in developing. I think the main problem is in maintenance, and that's where we see in the long run that problems can actually uh, exist. Uh, when people try to, to try to cut costs in maintenance of yeah. buildings, then you see real problems like, for instance, the Grenfell Towers in, in, in London. Okay. And, and that in developing, they just want 
a return on investment. I mean, we have discussions with pension funds that just say we want 3.5% or 20 years. And then you say, okay, we do it or we, do, we don't do it. But I don't recognize that in, uh, in the Netherlands. I, I think uh, they um, um, be owner for more than 25 years, mostly 40 years. So the maintenance is, I think, as good as, as a housing association. Let's move on to another topic. I think this was very, very interesting, but we have some more statements. Now we see something completely different, which is really fascinating. Actually, the best of two worlds. Um, you see networks being built. So now there's a network strategy being ta taking place. You see networks being built per sector. You mentioned Coplink, right? But we also, as I saw, showed a picture of Rescope, which is a European-wide network of uh, energy communities. You also have in the Netherlands, uh, Nederland Sorgt voor Elkaar. That's a, a collectivity of a care cooperatives, many, many care cooperatives. You, so you see they, they employ a network strategy which allows these local organizations to remain small and stick to their original um, motives, basically, and way of working, but do inter interconnect in what we would call a polycentric way um, across the sector, but also sometimes over the borders of the sector. So, so I, I thought it was really fascinating what uh, Tine de Moore was explaining about how, and uh, in, in, in she, she works with uh, cooperatives in, in, in bottom-up organizations in a number of sectors, yeah, a number of fields, not, not housing particularly, uh, but the trend really is, is striking, the fact that uh, there's always this tension uh, in, in locally uh, born uh, organizations that uh, if you go bigger, you lose your values, your original ethos, and then you professionalize, and then there we go again, you know. Um, so is this a dilemma you recognize, and how in the Dutch context, for instance, I'm looking at, at, at Trevor, can we avoid this? Uh, Tine, uh, Tine mentions um, networks of smaller organizations, uh, care, you know, sometimes yeah. integrating different services. Yeah, I, I think there's a, a, a lot of um, opportunity in network organizations and uh, not only, I mean, we see with a lot of the initiatives Co-oplink, their, um, their drivers are not just housing, their drivers are community care, their, their drivers are the environment or, or whatever. But as Co-oplink, we're also in a network of other um, organizations, network organizations, who are Championing, championing um, bottom up. So we're uh, talking to organizations in terms of care, we're talking to uh, organizations in terms of energy uh, uh, cooperatives, we're talking uh, organizations who help uh, people in, uh, in, in poor neighborhoods uh, to uh, create ec economic activity. And um, about half a year ago, uh, we all got together with the top four civil servants of three of four ministries and said to them if you look at government policy government policy is not only very top down but a lot of government programs are only um, available if you've got millions or billions to invest whereas if you look at the whole land there are loads of individual in initiatives who could um, make a very important contribution to the goals of policy, but they are not, because they're bottom up and they're small and they're local, they're not being uh, able to access government. Um, and the outcome of that discussion with the four heads of the, uh, of the, of the civil servants was that they have at least written um, a letter to the people who are now create, uh, hoping to create a, form, a new coalition government saying, in policies in the future, we must look at more um, opportunities for local bottom-up initiatives. And I think that that would be very significant if we did that. Um, and in terms of, uh, I think the strength is quite often the local, the s but the strength is also collaboration between, between uh, units, and there's all different ways to, to uh, facilitate that. Um, in the late 1970s, uh, I worked in a secondary cooperative in London. A secondary cooperative was a, an organization which supported housing cooperatives. We provided them with uh, 
accountancy, we provided them with development uh, people, we provided them with people who helped them form communities, but they managed us. So they were also the people who said, you work for us, so they, and that meant that we had a network of, um, when, I, when I left, we had a network of about 35 housing cooperatives, plus uh, about 50 what we called short life groups, which were groups which were using property from public bodies for a limited time on license. Um, and they were very active within their community. And that's something that I see in, in the, uh, the, the um, cooperatives or the um, cooperative housing groups that I know here in the Netherlands. I've, some of them I've worked with for the last 35 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. They're not only about themselves, about their little community, they're about the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So they have a very positive influence on what's happening around them. Um, and I think that that's something that we should uh, nurture, mm -hmm. and I think that policymakers should nurture that. Karin, you, you want to react to that? Maybe you see that yeah, also I in Delft. Uh, I think uh, it could be possible that we uh, get collaborative housing or corporate housing more in our program. Uh, we have one uh, uh, pro uh, a part who wants to do that, but I think financing is really a problem. So when you you are not in the social housing and you go to the bank, uh, they, they it's very difficult to get a loan for it. So I think we have uh, we have to do something to get that better. It's really a well, problem. We, uh, I'm pleased to say that there's there are um, very positive uh, developments in the Netherlands in terms of of, of housing cooperative finance. Um, the first cooperatives in the new wave, if you like, mm -hmm. had to go to, to a German bank yeah. because they understand um, uh, what a cooperative is. But uh, there are two, at least two banks in the Netherlands who are now developing products for housing cooperatives. Uh, yesterday evening, ha um, I was in a co-op link we organize every three weeks. We organize a, a session to, to exchange knowledge in, uh, to groups. Um, one of the people that was on cooperative fi finance yesterday evening, and one of the people who took part was was uh, somebody from the Rabo Bank, one of, uh, which originally is a cooperative bank, um, who was telling people who were sort of saying, "How do we get finance?" He was saying, "Well, um, I'll put my details in the chat. You can contact me. We're looking at a new product, uh, which will probably mean that we'll be able to finance more and uh, than uh, we would normally do." with a much lower uh, requirement to pay off the total loan, which made the business case more interesting. And on top of that, we have in um, the, the local authority in Amsterdam has now got a, a fund, which partly funds mm -hmm. the part that the banks don't fund, but also partly funds the, the development. Mm -hmm. That fund is administered by uh, an organization in the Netherlands here, which administers mm -hmm. money for housing for local authorities. Mm -hmm. SVN is the uh, SVN, uh, yeah. abbreviation. That's what they've now done for Amsterdam. They're about to uh, make available to every local authority mm -hmm. who wants to use it. But there's one problem. Amsterdam is not Holland. And all the cities, <laughs> except Amsterdam, are so poor that they can't do that kind of things. I would like to do, but we can't. And I think Amsterdam is quite different from M Probably it's, Rotterdam. It's, it's a revolving fund, so yeah, it's but not you have to put the money there, yeah. and that's really a problem for some cities. Okay. So uh, maybe we can hear uh, briefly from other cities. How do you deal with financing for cooperatives? You are very consolidated. You've been there around for over 100 years. Uh, I, I realize here we are in a very privileged situation in, in Zurich, uh, but we, what we do is we talk to the banks and we explain our business model and in the end we own the land, we own the houses and this is a security for them. Uh, we only have to explain the business model and uh, as soon as they realize the business model uh, and as soon as they realize that we do not evaluate in our balance sheet uh, the market value, but the initial value where we bought the, the houses from, we have to explain that, then they are very willing to, to, uh, to, to offer loans. And actually, the, the organization I represent, it's the largest housing cooperative in, in Switzerland. We, uh, only two months ago, we issued even a sustainability bond on the capital market. Uh, so we were even able to access this market. 
what helps is not the, the, the money or not the loans from the city, but the security of the city for, for smaller cooperatives. So they, they secure the loan, which is a very safe thing, even for poor communities, uh, uh, and, doesn't, uh, and doesn't give them the need to take the money in the hand. Yeah, it's a very po uh, different point of departure because, as I said, uh, history plays a role, time plays a role here. So we, we are, we're starting here, in a way, in, 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 yeah. uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, yes? But can I come back to the, the scaling up of the cooperatives? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. Because uh, the, the cooperative is about one people, one vote. And uh, we, we have now 8,000 members. And luckily enough, not all of the members um, come to our general assembly because uh, uh, that wouldn't work. So we, we have 800 uh, that come to the general assembly and this is still working. We saw in Switzerland cooperatives that were at that level and for scaling up they introduced a delegate system. So they had a, a smaller cooperative, they delegated uh, to a superior body. And this is not a stable system for on the long-term run. And uh, it's, I think it's there because it's losing the way of working. It's losing the connection to, to the people, to the, the people that are voting. So uh, if any of you uh, are, are uh, beyond this 8,000, uh, um, of it's course, I know in the Netherlands the, the cooperatives are much bigger <laughs> than, than in Switzerland, uh, do not introduce delegated systems. We'll bear that in mind, uh, Hans. <laughs> I think uh, Bjorn wanted to something and, and yeah, Edward. Just, um, just to add, and, and I know Rescoop, uh, the, the example that was given quite well because they're also very much orientated in, in Belgium about energy cooperatives. Uh, <coughs> and what we did in, in the housing sector, okay, it's not with individual tenants that are uh, cooperatives, but it's with our housing companies, and some of them are very small. We set up a, a, a very large uh, cooperative model, uh, Astra it's called, and, and uh, the aim is to install at a very large scale solar panels on the social housing uh, sector in, in Flanders, about 100,000 houses that we will equip. And that's something that our members, uh, so the housing companies, couldn't do on their own. So I believe very much uh, in, in the, the, the trying to, to keep that local connection and, and the, the smaller scale in place, but at the same moment combining things, because that's one of the big advantages of our sector is that we're normally not competitors against each other. So we can actually sit together and see what we can do together uh, without uh, cherry picking from each other. And, and that I think is very important if you do that from a cooperative model. We also have some, some tenant cooperatives with, with well, above 2,000 uh, corporates. So that, that's, that's difficult to get, get a board of directors in place and things like that. Um, but, but working together from, from smaller, very locally based uh, models, I think it's very important also from, from a collaborative model. And that, that's what we see with the CLT and, uh, that, that we're doing in Flanders in Belgium. Uh, they're still very small. We support them from, from social housing because they don't have land, they don't have engineers, they don't have the capacity to build it themselves. Uh, but we provide our knowledge, we provide our land under <coughs> small pressure from the local government. <laughs> but it, 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 it's a good way to combine all these, these experiences and I think that that's a very important lesson. Indeed. Eduard. Yeah, just maybe mention that in our case, um, the sector is so small and just emerging that the question maybe doesn't apply, but what we've realized is that uh, the, the, the potential of collaboration between the groups and between the initiatives is really important and that when it comes to financing, for instance, their ability to lobby the institutions as a collective, as a sector, has really proven to be uh, the, the, the key for them to, to then get financing from the public uh, banks, not so much from the private commercial uh, institutions yet, but they've really uh, come a long way in, in, in making this advocacy as a sector. So I don't know that in some cases they, they do have a, a, a second tier system in which cooperatives, there are, there's the big cooperative that then has smaller cooperative projects. And I think this relationship will evolve over time. We'll see what the result is. But so far, uh, I think they've seen a lot of uh, potential in, 
economies of scale in you know, working together to sort out a lot of the technical difficulties, for instance, of getting um, only one um, electricity uh, counter uh, for the whole um, building. This is something in Spain that the, ele the electric companies just don't understand. They want one for each apartment because they want or they expect that each apartment will be sold as you know, individual property. Uh, so they had to fight that as a sector. Uh, and I think this is really uh, something that we learned uh, along the way. Very interesting. And, and I thought also part of the appeal to have uh, Zurich and Barcelona here is that uh, you have such a long history and, and, and you have institutionalized in a way, in many ways, uh, whereas you ha have just started. So perhaps here in the Dutch context, we can also uh, draw some lessons, inspiration and practical tips on how <laughs> on the counter, the number of counters. Let's move on to another statement. I have two left. Um, so let's, let's move on, please. Um. That we should understand the context that we're working in, I think, understanding the, the housing regulations and the subsidies or the maybe permitting possibilities. Of course, that's key for architects and developers and people financing projects to know what's possible. Um, you can't build something if it's not going to get a permit or not going to be financed or, or it's just illegal. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a huge challenge for architects and developers to really under, understand this in some ways changing environment. My comment on that was I wanted to add to that, that in, in times like this, where things are going into a new dynamic, it's even important to understand something like a constitution of a country. Because we're talking about house, housing, and the point has been made a couple of times today that housing is a right. But where is this written? Well, it's written in the constitution. At the, at the national level, maybe, maybe even at the city level, state, or at the European level. And in Berlin, this is a huge issue right now. We, we have this expropriation initiative, for example, and that will be decided on, on the, the, the legality according to the Constitution. And I, I had another question that perhaps uh, in the examples that we, you were uh, bringing to the exhibition and doing research on. Do you think that in order to, for these communities to work, or at least the communities that you were uh, you know, looking at, were very homogeneous in terms of social class, race, uh, ethnicity, cultural background? And do you think those questions will, like diversity, will increase tension in this type of utopian communities? It's, it's, it's very um, different. I mean, there were very different projects. There were projects that were um, mostly smaller projects, bottom-up projects where I would think people were very homogeneous. But if you think about the, the last projects I showed, the, the bigger ones in, in Zurich, um, these are developed by uh, housing cooperatives. And their goal is that the people kind of are, uh, show the average of uh, people in Switzerland. Mm. So different, uh, different age groups, different incomes, and so on. Yeah, that's important no? to avoid like more like segregation again. And that, but uh, that's also, the, yeah, but that's also the, the, I mean, if it's a cooperative, you have a say and you can decide on because you're part of that. You become part of that uh, cooperative and then you can decide who is, who is, part. Uh, who is, is it, how is it yeah, developing, in which direction, and who's renting mm. the shop. Is it some kind of chain or is it uh, the local, uh, I don't know, coffee roaster or whatever. Mm. So there is, uh, of course, um, the possibilities uh, and also the exactly, uh, yeah. possible difficulties. So uh, now we move on to a topic which is, is more sensitive and we see this discussion happening very often when we talk about uh, the right to cooptation that these groups have and to what extent this clashes a little bit with the uh, universal right to housing, especially in a context of scarcity, right? So we had first uh, Michael Lafon from Berlin saying, yeah, right to housing. We assume that there is a right to housing, but is there really? You know, is this really a right? Where? Article, article 20, true of the Belgian constitution. Right, there we have and a very we go, we, <laughs> we went to the European court quite recently to say that the Flemish government is not doing enough. Well, there we go. We have the right and we have a way, in a way to enforce the right. But what happens when there are groups who want to live in a certain way 
and uh, they want support, often public support, to be able to choose the people they want to live with. And I've had this question asked many times to me um, as, as someone who, who works in the field of collaborative housing as research, but you know, it is a dilemma. So I would like to hear your views about this. Uh, in student housing, it's usual here in Delft, so why not uh, in regular housing? But I think it's uh, a problem of two less houses and who has the first right. So I think that you have to arrange at a, in a good and way. And scarce resources, in my view. Yeah. I mean, you, you have not a lot of money from the government to solve the housing problem. So you have to, you have to choose as a government mm -hmm. in, a, in, in a collective way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's sometimes difficult uh, if we are asked to do cooperative, collaborative uh, models. Then you have something like, okay, now the other tenants will decide which tenant will be able to live there, but is that also the tenant from the policy government perspective that is most in need of housing? That's, it, 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 it's, it's, in my view, a very difficult dilemma. We have found a solution, and that's that if we set something like that up, we use the pool of social tenants, and we ask them <laughs> if they want to participate in a cooperative model. Yeah. But of course, that's not, not <laughs> uh, well, it, it, it's a solution from the Flemish context. But, but in a global view, it's something very difficult uh, from a policy mm -hmm. perspective, in my view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you do it in, in Zurich? Uh, we uh, we have a, car a carta, uh, let's say that we, we we oblige ourselves to 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 give access to the to the, the weaker uh, particip participants in 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 this uh, model. So uh, the the ABZ, the the cooperative I'm working in, um, has 50% of the people living in our cooperative are earning uh, below one third of the population. So we we really do more. Uh, uh, than what is said, was said in, in, in the video uh, regarding um, uh, access for, for poor people. But we also have 3% that we would judge as being rich because we believe in, in, in the diversity, as uh, uh, was also said in, in the film, we believe in the diversity to form stable communities. It's not about, uh, as I said in the introdu introduction of the statement, it's not about the, the, the housing, it's, it's also about the community. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think uh, that, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, one thing. And uh, uh, one last thing I would like to, to mention here is, if you once have access to a cooperative housing in Switzerland, mm -hmm. you, you should not stop there. You should show solidarity with the people that not already are able to live in a com uh, community like uh, ABZ. So this means that we, we, uh, we want to grow, we want to grow bigger from, from, from one side as, as our organization, but we also, or all of our tenants pay five francs a month into a solidarity fund where we can finance projects worldwide uh, and help on other parts of the world growing, uh, growing the movement. So you're, you express solidarity not only with your fellow country people, but with oh. the world. That's Switzerland Thank for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> you should, yes, yes. Um, Edward, yeah. you want to say something? Yeah, in our case, because the cooperative projects are on public land and they get some subsidy, uh, all of the tenants need to be um, uh, from our uh, waiting list for affordable housing. So they need to comply with affordable housing criteria. And that means income, uh, not having another uh, apartment or home of your own, and so on. Um, so that's one way in which we influence, of course, the, the type of um, uh, residents. Now, something that to me is more relevant to the discussion is uh, how do we overcome the, the non-income related issues, such as social capital, such as having the time to engage with people and organize and be, you know, attend meetings. And this is really where we're, we're finding the, the, the most difficulty because even if we support the lower income, in, you know, providing additional subsidy, which we don't always have, but sometimes we do, um, it's still difficult for, for them to engage in the same way and not only low income, but migrant population, 
uh, when you have uh, a group that is mainly youth, how do you make sure that you also have the elderly present? You know, all of this makes it, um, I think, more difficult, and, and there's a need uh, for support for you know, community organizing. And this is, I think, it, it's, it's ongoing, and, and we're improving. I think every project that we do gets a little better, but I think there's a challenge that goes beyond the, the income uh, discussion. Indeed, yes. And I have a one last uh, statement that I think um, it's interesting to round up the discussion. Or you want to say something? Maybe I worked at a housing association who uh, had the appointment in the past with uh, tenants. You are above the list, but uh, 10 of you are above the list. We know in which neighborhood you want to live, but we are searching for the best matching for you for the right place. And I think that kind of systems have both in them. So I think we have to search for that kind of solutions. But there are solutions, basically. There is a way around it. It's not a um, black or white situation, yes or no. That's, that he gives uh, some hope. Let's move on to the next and last statement. But as we all know, I just said, you know, it's about hard work, labor. Um, if you put a group of people together with a collectivity of resources, you easily get what we call a social dilemma. So the difficult choice between your own part-time, oh, short-time um, uh, advantage and the long-term uh, collective advantage. You could, you know, that those things clash. We've seen that many times in, in the, during the pandemic, but uh, within these collectivities, they are encountering social dilemmas continuously, basically. And in order to deal with these social dilemmas, they set up institutions. They build they, rules, collectivities of rules, so to speak, and these are based on specific principles that are connected to values. And the principles um, are actually utility, that's more of the starting point. So you start from the usefulness of the resources that are available in a collective sense. So So uh, Tina de Moore was talking about this, this clash, another dilemma, she calls it the social dilemma. And I think it's a dilemma we see in, in not only in housing, uh, we see it in many cases when the individual short-term interest, so for your lifetime, you want to enjoy, for instance, uh, the, uh, the valorization, the, 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 you want to capture the value of, of, the, of, of an investment in housing, right? And ideally pass it on to your kids if, if you have them. Uh, whereas in, in community land trust models, for instance, or non-speculative uh, uh, affordability in perpetuity kind of models, you give up on this. And it's very hard. I've, I've had people working with these communities tell me, well, they have people who, who choose to go for this type of uh, housing, they have to have a hard conversation with their kids and explain, I'm doing this because I believe in it. And it's, it's, a, it's really important for me. How do you explain this to your kids? <laughs> that in a context where, well, we know the current young generation, it's called generation rent, they are in debt of their st with student loans, right? They, they are totally excluded from the market, the housing market. And on top of that, their parents, when they buy a house or become part owners, they say, sorry, you're not getting any of it. <laughs> so this is, this is uh, really tough. So how do we uh, deal with that as a society? If we, on the one hand, we advocate for long-term affordability, which means we, are, we cannot pass on to our uh, kids the, um, the value capture of an investment in the housing market. We offered uh, the kids of the people living in our flats the membership. And uh, through that membership, they, they can uh, uh, access the flat sooner or later if they want. So the, we do not inherit, uh, of course not, the, that would not work, but uh, they have the, the ability to, to get membership. What if they want to move to another city or another country? Uh, then they start anew. They start anew. Indeed. They start anew. Indeed. But uh, uh, you mentioned the Sweden model. Uh, um, uh, and the Sweden model failed because the younger people didn't have the capital to access the, the ownership market. 
and also uh, didn't uh, the, the migrants, peop uh, uh, people that migrated to, to, to Sweden. So this ownership model uh, uh, failed anyway. Uh, so the, the rental model, has, uh, because it doesn't have this capital need, is, is a better way, an easier and accessible way for, for, for younger people or, or less resourced people. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's also, in, in a way, uh, based on a narrative, how you, you look at housing, how you look, for instance, we, we discussed land, and, and, and Geert uh, from, from CLT Brussels told something very interesting, and, and I think the Native uh, Americans also said that, can you own land? W what an absurd idea that you can own a piece of land. I won't go in <laughs> that, that discussion, but it, it has something to do with the view. And when we started talking about this kind of collaborative models, uh, a lot of, 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 of people we talked with also said to us, well, yeah, but, but people want, want indeed that, that inheritance, want, want to build that house. And I had something like, but a lot of people are living in a house they own that they can't sell tomorrow or that they can't claim. I mean, people living in an apartment building they can't say, I want my four square meters of land my building is standing on. No, they are also part of a kind of collective structure. So it's, it's from a perspective point of view, it's not so straight, but you have to tell it and you have to build a narrative about it and you have to give good examples. Uh, and then step by step, people will start, in my view, uh, seeing the advantages. Uh, and I think that, that in most cooperative structures, you can sell the share you have also, and that you, uh, but at least in, co in, in the CLT projects in, in Brussels, uh, you won't lose any money, and, and it, it's, uh, there's an interest rate on it. So what you put in, you will get out in the long run. But must we start the discussion at the other side? I am from the generation who could buy a house for a very low pl price. And if you see what the, uh, the worth of my house now is, that's good for me, it's good for my children. But if you have parents who couldn't afford to buy a house and had also always a rental house, then those children don't have that access. And I think that's really, at this moment, a big problem in Holland. Absolutely, yeah. Trevor, you wanted to say something about that. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's all um, about the way we look at, at, at property. Um, the expectation that you're going to, going to make money out of property is, is inherent in the, in the present system. If I look at quite a few of the people who are starting new initiatives for housing cooperatives, they want to get out of that system. They, what, what they want is an affordable rent Quite a lot of them, um, we're also from the generation where a lot of people had a job for life. Mm -hmm. uh, that isn't so. A lot of the people, the young people today, are uh, working as, uh, as, um, for themselves. Um, or they've got jobs with very little job security. Um, then living in a community with a, an affordable rent is something of value. And I, when I, when I have this discussion quite a lot, when I always think of a situation, um, there's a, a group that I've worked with for 25 years, um, and they were so dissatisfied with the quality of housing management by the housing association, they said, we want to manage it ourselves. And the Secretary of State at that time said, okay, we'll make an experiment and you can take over the property, and you'll have to get a loan to pay for it, you'll have to pay market value for, for the property, and um, there was a lot of maintenance that needed to be doing. There were 72 dwellings. They said, we'll, do, we'll give all the tenants one chance to buy, and 23 did, and with the money for the 23 uh, paid for their houses, we renovated, or they renovated, I helped them, all the 72 dwellings, so they all were well, up to, to standard. One of the people who wanted to buy had just lost his job, and he, so he had to be, remain a tenant. And 10 years afterwards, he said to me, I'm so pleased I didn't buy, because the people who bought, every time there's a major piece of maintenance to be done, they have to pay for it themselves. I don't, I pay rent. Um, 
now that I've got another job, I've got a little bit more money, so I've got a bit of money. So what do I do? I invest that money, I've got a better return on that probably <laughs> in the long term than what I would have got if I bought the house, paid for the maintenance all those years. So it's, it's also a mindset. Um, and well, I think that's important in this sort of decision. Absolutely. And well, for many decades, we've had the, the, the mindset, the mainstream is uh, home ownership for a number of ideological reasons also, no? I mean, the governments we've, uh, that's been in charge, uh, they have decided this is the way to devolve uh, responsibility to the citizens and to get them to uh, become responsible for their own care and pension, etc. So it is, it is uh, really not rooted on any science uh, or economic science, it's rooted on an ideology. Um, I would like to give the floor to Edward before we wrap up. I just wanted to say the exact same thing. I think we are, we're not really comparing things fairly between rent and home ownership. And in the case of Spain, I think home ownership was also seen as a, a security for life considering that the rental sector could be legally, you know, would change from government to government, whereas home ownership has always been much more stable. It's more, much more difficult to change the, you know, the conditions for home ownership. There are much more uh, stakes um, to, to, to take care of, whereas rent has always been very unstable. But if I could choose between a very stable, affordable rent for life to buying a, an apartment, I would choose the rent. Now, I have bought an apartment because the rental sector is so unstable that I, that I, I, I don't see myself in that. I, I always tell this uh, story that a few years ago when I was in a large housing uh, studies conference from the European Network for Housing Research, ENHR. So f imagine an auditorium full of housing researchers and uh, talk after talk advocating enough with home ownership is bad, uh, we should all be tenants. And then there was one uh, researcher who, who was giving a talk, suddenly said, I would like to uh, please raise your hand, those of you who own a home. <laughs> okay, enough said. We can preach, but on an individual level, it's really difficult to make that decision. And I think that is part of the problem, and this is why we also need to think and do and act, uh, act together to try and change the system in a way that becomes more consistent with what we preach in a way. And I'm looking at Desiree because uh, I would like to hear what, what are your thoughts? I mean, you seem to be at the end of a spectrum in terms of, you know, where we work and, 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 and the yeah. more, let's say, socially uh, oriented people. But I know you, you also have... Um, values that are consistent with what we're talking about as a developer. It doesn't yeah. mean that you only think about money, right? No, like the stereotype. No, we so I would are like to know what do you make of this? Well, what, what we are not only about making money, you're right, of course. We are ma about making good neighborhoods and good communities and making the, also the public space very attractive. So it's not only about the house or it's, yeah, so it's about the whole system that needs to be improved. And I find it funny that this is your wrap-up statement because I thought, oh my God, what am I going to say about that? Because I think, eh, I agree with all of you, we shouldn't, housing shouldn't be a financial product for the people living in it. And the way you stated it, if children don't want their parents to rent because they cannot inherit the, the value of the house, it's actually a crazy idea. Housing should be a sort of a public or a, eh, a public issue. So we need to take care of that. And um, it is not just about the houses. That's what uh, project developers always say. It's about the whole area. Also about the climate uh, adaptation issue, which is very big at the moment. Biodiversity is probably one of the biggest things we have to tackle. So we have to find new ways in developing uh, interesting uh, areas, housing areas. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's all about those things and involving uh, future inhabitants at an early stage and giving their, them a bigger role is one of the issues for us to change the sector in. Indeed. So I see a lot of things happening in, in my business which are on the good, uh, in the good uh, direction. Indeed, and I think you mentioned something very, very important as well, that we, for the purpose of time and, you know, having to choose topics, we didn't touch directly upon, which is the, 
uh, environmental aspects, sustainability, biodiversity, circularity in neighborhoods. And this is something that actually is very much connected to the motivations of many of these groups, as we know. Huh? You mentioned Ecuador uh, as well. Um, it, so th it is not alien to these groups to also uh, engage with this big challenge, uh, the sustainability challenge. But maybe that's for another series of uh, BK Talks. Uh, and, well, I'm looking at uh, my colleague Javier, who's here to uh, wrap up the, the, the event. I would just like to thank um, everyone today. I think you did a fantastic job at, at this kind of experimental format we proposed. We have a nice story. And, um, well, uh, I also would like to thank uh, my colleagues who, ha who work really hard to make this happen, in, in particular Mariah Pöte, also Valerie Heysackers, and uh, Javier's team. Lex uh, and the others, uh, everyone has really, really worked very hard to, to create a wonderful s series. Uh, so, big uh, applause to you. And um, yeah, please, Javier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darinka, and thank you very much uh, to everyone for being here today, as well as to the other participants. Thanks for the audience that is here, and thanks to the audience that is listening from home. Um, I'm very, uh, very happy about these last uh, BK Talks, about the new format that we just experimented. Thank you very much, Darink, for being the, the sort of the cobaya of this, uh, of this BK Talk format, which worked really, really well, and I think we need to uh, keep, uh, keep doing it. Um, thank you very much to you and your team uh, for all the work that you put together doing the BK Talks, everything else that you have done, as well as the exhibition, which is here in this uh, space that we'll be finishing today. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, uh, ending this session and listening to a developer saying that housing is not a product. So that's really news. Uh, a developer just told us that housing is not a product and I, I am really happy to live that way. Um, housing is a very delicate topic and you just mentioned that and housing is our it's, our, it's a desire that we have, so it's very difficult to, uh, yes, uh, let's say, to put so many things together no? and talk about subjective and personal desires. I think housing is a topic we need to keep on talking about uh, in the future and we we'll definitely will do. In the next spring we will organize another BK Talks about uh, which will, uh, let's say, talk about the One Million Homes program in the Netherlands. We want to not only talk about it from the Dutch point of view, but also from the international point of view. So we, will, we, are, we have started working on it for the next semester. In any case, we will come back on the 23rd of, um, sorry, 24th of November with a uh, BK Talks uh, in collaboration with the Bakema Center here at the faculty and at uh, Het New Institute in Rotterdam. And then on the 25th, we will talk about circularity uh, with another team from the uh, urbanism department. Um, before I say goodbye and uh, say you good night, I, I couldn't help reading or finding a text, which is very short. I will read it very, very quickly. And this is the article number 47 of the Spanish Constitution. It says, it's, very, it's just 50 words. It says, all Spaniards, let's talk about everyone, every citizen, have the right to enjoy a decent and adequate home. The public powers will promote the necessary conditions and establish the pertinent norms to make this right effective, regulating the use of the land in accordance with the general interest to prevent a speculation. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>